Good morning and welcome to our time together today in God's Word. My name is Pastor Tom Robbins. I'm pastor here at Faith Baptist Church of Camp Point, Illinois. I'm so glad that you've chosen to join us today. We are continuing our study in the book of Genesis and today we come to Genesis chapter 23. And the title of the message for today is A Family Funeral. If you have a Bible, I encourage you to take it and open with me to Genesis chapter 23. We'll be referring to uh, the verses from this chapter as we work our way through the passage today. We've been reminded over and over again in the book of Genesis of the reality of death. In Genesis chapter 2, God gave Adam and Eve one restriction. Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. In Genesis 3, Adam and Eve sinned and ate the fruit of the tree, and death came not only upon them, but upon all mankind. Physical death, which is separation from life, but also spiritual death, which is separation from God. Before Genesis 3, no one died, and no one would have died had sin not entered the, the picture. But after Genesis 3, we have multiple reminders of death in the book of Genesis. In Genesis chapter 4, Cain kills Abel. In the genealogy of Genesis chapter 5, we find the phrase over and over, and he died. In Genesis chapter 7, we're told that all flesh died in the flood. After the flood, the the earth is repopulated by Noah's family, but the cycle of life and death continues. And so when we come to Genesis chapter 23, we find the record of another death, the death of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Here we find more information than a simple phrase, Sarah died. The chapter tells the story of the purchase of a burial place for Sarah, which will also become the burial place for Abraham and several of his family, of, of his descendants. Genesis 23 is an interesting chapter. It reminds us of the reality of life and death, but it also gives us a look at the, the practical process that Abraham faced when Sarah died. I call this chapter a family funeral. So let's look together at this passage today, and at the end we'll consider some practical and important reminders for us. The passage begins in verses 1 and 2 by recording Sarah's death. Listen to these verses. Sarah lived 127 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah. So Sarah died in Kerjath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. Now we learn several uh, facts here in these opening verses. Uh, first, we're told about how old Sarah was when she died. She was 127 years old. Uh, she lived to that good old age. Isaac, her son, would have been about 37 years old uh, by this time. But not only did she live a long and fruitful life, we're told in verse 2 that she died there in, in Hebron in the land of Canaan, which is exactly where God wanted them to be at this point. This was the land that God had promised and given to them. So we're told these facts about Sarah and that she died. But along with us, we see recorded the sorrow that Abraham had. Abraham had shared his life with Sarah. They had shared life together in Canaan for 60 years. And so his sorrow was real. It says that he came to mourn for Sarah. Uh, the picture is beating of the breast. It's of, of severe mourning and, and that he wept for her. Uh, this is the lamenting process. Uh, uh, it includes wailing or bewailing in, in the formal rites of, of a death. Verses 1 and 2 give us the simple facts of Sarah's death. But the text moves very quickly in verse 3 to Abraham's purchase. It doesn't dwell on the death, and it quickly goes to the business aspect of it, if you will. And, and you might say, why would this happen so quickly? Well, in 
the land of Canaan in that area, burial was, uh, it was the law that uh, the body was to be buried within one day of death. And also the climate would have called for this because of the, the extreme heat. Now we have to remember, Abraham was a nomad. That meant that he didn't own any property. He was one who had been traveling and he, he was a tent dweller, if you will. He didn't own property. But he wanted to care for the body of Sarah, uh, this one that he had loved. And so to do that, he knew that he needed some property. So he goes to those who do own land and he makes a general request. And we, we see that in um, that he goes to um, the gate of the city, the place where business is transacted. And he makes that request in verse 4. He says, I am a foreigner and a visitor among you. Give me property for a burial place among you that I may bury my dead out of my sight. Now, as we go on in the text, we'll discover he wasn't asking for a gift. Uh, he was just asking to be given a, a piece of property that, that he could purchase. Uh, he wanted, he was inquiring to see if there was, was anything available. And immediately he got an answer in verses 5 and 6. Uh, verse 6 says, Hear us, my Lord. You are a mighty prince among us. Abraham was well respected. Bury your dead in the choicest of our burial places. None of us will withhold from you his burial place that you may bury your, your dead. The people were, were very responsive to Abraham. said, take your pick. Uh, take the choicest of the land. So Abraham uh, has already been thinking about this evidently because he makes a specific request. Notice verse 8. If it is your wish that I bury my dead out of my sight, hear me and meet with Ephron the son of Zohar for me, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he has, which is at the end of his field. Let him give it to me at the full price. Here he intends to purchase it as property for a burial place among you. He's already picked out this cave of Machpelah that was owned by Ephron. He says, I'll, I'll buy it for, for what it's worth. Now he receives an answer. Ephraim is, happens to be there at the time and he tells Abraham that, that, that he will give him that land. Notice verse 10, uh, excuse me, verse 11. He said, no, my Lord, hear me. I give you the field and the cave that is in it. I give it to you in the presence of the sons of my people. I give it to you, bury your dead. Now, a, a couple of things about what Ephraim says here. It was customary in the time that uh, if you ad admired something to somebody else, that person would offer it to you as a gift. Now, it was not expecting that you would take it, uh, but it was to start some haggling perhaps over it. If you made a comment about something. So Abraham uh, commented that he wanted this, this cave. And so in the culture of the day, it was offered to him as a gift. And notice that he not only offered the cave, but the field with it as well. And that's probably because of the law of the land, that if somebody purchased a cave that was a part of a field that you owned, you would still have some liability because you owned the field. So Ephraim was offering not only the cave, but the field so that Abraham would have full ownership and also full liability for uh, whatever took place in, in that area. Well, this leads to the settlement over or the process here as he's offered to him the, the cave and the field. Abraham wants the land, so he pushes for this settlement and he, he says that, I, I want to purchase it. Verse 13, he says, if you will give it, please hear me, I will give you money for the field. Take it from me that I may bury my dead. Abram says, name your price, essentially. And so Ephraim does that. Verse 15, my Lord, listen to me. The land is worth 400 shekels of silver. What is that between you and me? So bury your dead. Now, again, you need to remember the culture. Uh, Ephraim names a price that was probably 10 to 20 times worth uh, the actual value of the land. Was he trying to take advantage of Abraham? Well, possibly, but it's also quite likely that he was starting the haggling process. You show interest in something. 
You say, give it, I want to give it to you as a gift. The person says, no, I'll buy it. And so the person that's selling uh, names a, a high price, expecting the haggling to start. So he says, 400 shekels of silver. But that's not what happens in this situation. Uh, you notice that Abraham says, okay, I'll pay it. Verse 16, he weighed out the silver for Ephraim, which he had named in the hearing of the sons of Heth, 400 shekels of silver, currency of the merchants. Abraham didn't want to waste time and stoop to haggling. He wanted this property. He wanted to bury his wife, so he paid the price. And the purchase of a burial place by Abraham here was a confirmation that Canaan was his home. Where do you bury your loved ones? You bury them in the place that is home. And the purchase was also a statement of faith on behalf of Abraham. He was essentially saying, God promised this land to me and to my seed. Now I'm purchasing this because we will have a permanent future burial place for our family. He said, I'll pay the price. And so the transaction uh, is made in verses 17 and 18. It says, the field of Ephraim, which was in Machpelah, which was before Mamre, the field and the cave, which was in it, and all the trees that were in the field, which were within all the surrounding borders, were deeded to Abraham as a possession in the presence of the sons of Heth before all who went in at the gate of the city. Uh, it officially became Abraham's possession. He paid the price. It was deeded over to him, and it was done in the gate of the city, which was the place for legal and business dealings. It was officially witnessed by those there, so that there could be no question that now this cave and this field were the property of Abraham. Well, Abraham did this so that he could bury his wife, and that's what we find in the last two verses. After this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of Machpelah, before Mamre, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. So the field and the cave that is in it were deeded to Abraham by the sons of Heth as property for a burial place. Uh, just a simple statement, no details, emphasizing again that the property became the property of Abraham. It was his ownership, emphasizing the location. Now, uh, that's significant because as you go on in the Word of God, you discover that this cave becomes the burial place not only for Sarah, but for Abraham and for Isaac and for Rebecca and for Leah and for Jacob. This was the family burial plot. So this was a significant historical purchase by Abraham, putting down roots, if you will, there in the land of, Can uh, of Canaan. Today, if you were to go there, uh, it's my understanding that there's a large Muslim mosque that, that stands over the traditional site, and there's monuments to, to these who are, are buried there today. Well, Genesis 23, uh, and we went through it rather quickly as a, as a practical chapter here, is an interesting and practical chapter of Scripture. And it reminds us that Abraham and Sarah were humans, just like us, who face the same everyday life experiences that we face. What can we learn from this chapter of Scripture? Well, I want to share with you four reminders. First of all, in this text, we are reminded that death is a reality. Sarah's death recorded in this chapter of Genesis reminds us once again that, that death is a reality. Because of sin, which entered the picture in Genesis 3 when Adam and Eve sinned, we all have to deal with death. We all face the reality of physical death. There will come a day when our physical life will end. Hebrews 9.27 tells us that it's appointed for men to die. We all also face the reality of spiritual death. Because of death, because of sin, we are born spiritually dead, separated from God by the barrier of our sin. Romans 5.12 says, Therefore, just as through one man, Adam, sin entered the world and death through sin and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. We all face the reality of spiritual death because we all are sinners. We are reminded every day of the reality of death. Death 
is a reality. The second reminder is that grief is a necessity. We're told here in the opening verses here that after Sarah died, Abraham mourned and wept. And that's okay. It didn't show a a lack of faith on Abraham's part, but rather it expressed the emotion that's very real and very normal when we're faced with the reality of death. The Bible reminds us over and over again that grief is a normal and necessary emotion, especially at the time of death. Even Jesus wept. John eleven thirty five 35 tells us that when his friend Lazarus died, that he wept. So when faced with the reality of death, don't try to suppress your emotion. Let it out. It's good and healthy to cry, to, to talk to others, to mourn. But thankfully, if you're a believer, the Bible tells us that you sorrow not as those who have no hope. And we'll say more on hope here in a few minutes. Death is a reality. Grief is a necessity. The third reminder is that planning is a responsibility. This is chapter of scripture is a practical reminder for us. Most of this passage today was about Abraham carefully making the necessary arrangements to care for Sarah's body after her death. Abraham certainly took his responsibility seriously. And when Abraham took care of the arrangements for Sarah's body, uh, he was also planning ahead for when he and other f- members of his family would die. It's just a, reman- a reminder that it's okay to plan when it comes to dealing with your death and funeral. Planning ahead helps to take some of the burden off of your loved ones when the time comes that you die. Planning ahead helps to give direction for your funeral. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you should want the direction of your funeral to point people to Jesus Christ. I'm not saying that we should all be obsessed with thinking about and planning for our funerals, but it is a responsibility to think about and to take seriously. Death is a reality. Grief is a necessity. Planning is a responsibility. But the final reminder for today is the most important as we think about death, and that is that Jesus is the remedy. Yes, death is a reality, both physical and spiritual death. But when it comes to spiritual death, we must not forget that Jesus is the remedy. He's the cure for spiritual death. Even in Genesis 3, when when death, the wages of sin, became a reality, we were reminded that God had a remedy in the seed of the woman, the, the promised one, the Messiah. That promised one is Jesus. Because we are sinners, we are destined for eternal death, eternal separation from God in hell. Romans 6.23 tells us that. And because of Jesus, though, we have a remedy for our sin. Jesus took our place. He died to pay the penalty for our sin. And then he rose again, proving that he is greater than sin and victorious over sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21 reminds us that God the Father made him, God the Son, to be sin for us, he who knew no sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He became sin for us. How do we receive this remedy? Well, the Bible says that we must believe and receive. John 1.12 says, As many as receive him, to them he gives the right the power to become children of God to those who believe in his name. When we believe in Jesus and receive his righteousness, then we receive the sure hope of an eternal home in heaven with Jesus. It's what the Bible calls eternal life. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, will not die eternally, but have everlasting life. So while we're reminded every day of the reality of death and the seriousness of our eternal destiny, we have the wonderful hope and joy of the remedy for death, salvation in Jesus Christ. Have you put your faith in Jesus? Do you have the assurance that your sins are forgiven and you're on your way to eternal life in heaven? 
If not, then receive the remedy for your sin today and put your faith in Jesus. This may just be the story of the death and burial of Sarah, but it's a good and important reminder for us today that death is a reality. Grief is a necessity. Planning is a responsibility. And most importantly, Jesus is the remedy. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful that you give us these practical reminders in Scripture that uh, keep in front of us the reminder that our sin deserves the wages of death. And Lord, that we can be reminded that because of your love and grace, you have provided the remedy for death in Jesus Christ. So while we learn practically about death today, help us not to forget the importance of faith in Jesus Christ so that we will not have to face eternal death. Oh, we have to face physical death, but if we know Jesus, we will not have to face eternal death. So Lord, each one who's listening today, I pray that they would take this seriously and put their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ alone. In his name we pray, amen. Well, thank you so much for joining me today for this time in God's word. I trust that it's been something that's been an encouragement and a help to you. Uh, we invite you to join us here at Faith Baptist Church. We meet on Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock, and you're welcome to join us for our time uh, here as we worship the Lord and spend time in God's word together as part of our worship. If you're not able to join us th here, then I encourage you to join me once again next week as we uh, share God's word here online. Thank you so much. Goodbye.